Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Really appreciate it. Welcome to the Brave Angels Film Discussion Group. My name is Scott. I'm the um, chair. Uh, I've been with Brave Angels for about a year or so. Um, I'm also on the uh, Music and Arts Committee, and I recently joined uh, this one. So I'm looking forward to the discussions we're going to have and the films we're going to watch. So uh, tonight we're going to discuss The Banker. Um, uh, I saw it for the first time a few days ago, and I didn't know what to expect. I was very impressed. I feel like trailers never do a film justice. You got to watch it. And um, in addition, tonight we're also joined by Alex Finoy, who works at the make sure the Midwest Center Bank, if I have that right, Alex, out in uh, St. Louis. And so he's going to be giving us his perspective, and so have an added insight into the nature of the film and maybe obviously how the practices in banking have changed in that regard to now. And yeah, we're really excited to have him. Thanks for joining us, Alex. Um, I thought, and we could kind of, obviously, you know, this is a very fluid discussion, so it's gonna take different turns. Um, if it's okay with everyone to kind of start us off, so from, if any of you don't know this week, uh, the administration is starting to roll back um, a program that the Obama administration was pushing addressing a uh, housing discrimination. And so I found this out. I was like, well, this is a perfect kickoff for tonight because it's exactly relevant to the film. Um, so uh, just to really briefly cover it, um, on yesterday, they're eliminating an Obama era program intended to combat racial segregation in suburban housing, saying it amounted to federal overreach in the local communities. And for those of you who remember, that's what uh, Bernard and um, I believe Joseph were trying to push against. So um, I thought maybe Alex, if it's cool, maybe you could start us off and just maybe start by commenting on this and how it may relates back to the film. Sure. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, uh, Alex Fenoy with Midwest, I almost had it, Scott, Midwest oh. Bank Center. Uh, in, in St. Louis. And then just really quickly, um, uh, so I've been a banker, uh, no pun intended, for 28 years, all of my career in the St. Louis region. So just keep that in perspective. So somewhat uh, probably limited on a national basis. For the most part, I've, the majority of those years, I've worked at what's called community banks. So uh, not uh, only five years of 28 that I worked at super regional or national banks. So, so again, most of my career is a really St. Louis focus, not on a national basis. So I was look, I was telling Donna earlier, I was look personally looking forward to uh, the banker going back to, uh, cause it was originally supposed to come out in September of 2019. And uh, without, a lot of other stuff down to fill me in on kind of the backstory on why some things happened and delayed the film coming out. Uh, I personally have told all of my network, my customers, my colleagues, that this is a film that we should all see in whatever line of banking you're in. Um, because there's different business departments in, in our business lines in, in banks. Mortgage is its own animal. Commercial is its own animal. Consumer or retail is its own animal. Uh, my area of expertise, community and economic development, is another area that touches a lot of what was happening in the banker. So it really has, the history of it really, you have to go back to the end of slavery and then bring in, then come up to the time of the movie. So what happened at the end of slavery was the Freedmen's Bureau and a Freedmen's Bank was created, 1865. After President Lincoln's assassination, President Johnson immediately wiped out the Freedmen's Bank and the Freedmen's Bureau. Think 1865. One bank, one location in D.C. that um, Frederick Douglass was the chairman of and put most of his money to start it had $57 million. 
think of that number, 1865 had $57 million of former enslaved people's money that they had saved. The federal government stops supporting it. It fails. They lose all of that. Fast forward. Think how hard it would be to raise in 1865, $57 million. And you were formerly enslaved people. They do it, fails, lose all of that wealth. Then you fast forward 100 years to 1968, the year I was born, I'm 51 years old. And that's when the Fair Housing Act was enacted. So up until that point, redlining, black codes, all of that to stop people, formerly enslaved people from getting the, uh, uh, a piece of the American dream where still today America's biggest wealth asset is a home, that was all eliminated are virtually impossible to do. So now I'll go back to the movie, which is right after World War II, and just blatant redlining is rampant. And you take a person, I forget the characters, whichever the mathematician of the two uh, name, somebody that can do amortization schedules and interest in his head, and he has to hide behind another ethnic group to be a banker. It's crazy. But that's the country, that's the real history of our country. And we have to be unapologetically, in my, well, I'm not gonna say have to, my opinion, we should be unapologetically clear on that history. Now you come to your question, Scott, on what this administration, and I'm not red or blue, but rolling back fair housing when formerly enslaved people still have a major wealth gap that now you should be able to understand why that's there makes absolutely no sense. And other than to be divisive and it makes no economic sense for the good of the entire country because the whole prospers when every piece, not equally, but an equal opportunity to prosper. So I'll pause there. Um, it's just interesting because you basically summed it up. It makes no economic sense. It is merely a political, a divisive move. It serves no other purpose whatsoever. And the fact that this film takes place over, I guess, the course of, I mean, I, I think it was in the early 50s. Yeah, right. Two gentlemen linked Post up. World War it, II. Exactly, yeah. And it ended in, um, I guess that trial was what, like 65 or so? Yeah, it's about a 10 year period. Yeah. And like you said, here we are over 50 years later, and that very issue is still very much front and center. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this film couldn't be any more relevant now, in my opinion. Yeah. I think Richard had a, had a, crest, a question. Oh, okay. Did you, Richard? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Alex, for uh, uh, filling us in on the, on the brief history there. Um, uh, can you go into some detail about what this rollback means? And uh, I mean, I'm, first time I've heard about it, mm -hmm. um, I don't know any of the details about it. So if you, if you could explain to us um, what, what, the, what it means, that would be great. Sure. So, so let me put this major disclaimer out there that I've only been able to skim it all the way through, uh, not fully dig into it, but I'll plan on getting to that this weekend. But from what I gathered, it's basically going to allow suburban communities and neighborhoods to put up laws and codes on who they can exclude from buying 
and purchasing homes within their areas. So it is, <laughs> it, it, it's really opening up in a small way, but once you open the door in a crack, then it usually opens wider where you can, again, it's legalizing redlining again but in a narrow sense, in just suburbia. But think about the makeup of our country. Who's mostly in suburbia? Who's mostly in the inner city, in the core? And if suburbs can choose to exclude people for ethnicity, and I haven't read all the details and all the reasons, but I know ethnicity is one of them. It's probably other things. We're just going backwards as a country, not forward. But that's I can follow up on this weekend and send to Donna and Scott after I read it line by line. And and I have to do it for my career anyway. So I, I you know, I'll I'll send my points with the whole bill itself. So you can read it yourself. Yeah. I'm curious as to what the motivation was behind here. <laughs> uh, not on the movie and, and my opinion and these my I should have said this disclaimer this is Alex Fenoy's opinion not necessarily Midwest Bank Center's uh, opinion so uh, I, I think it, it's feeding into a narrative of fear and what some uh, in his base I'm not going to say everybody uh, I don't know everybody in there uh, it goes along with the fear, with the, the same thinking of building a wall to exclude. It's just another way to exclude and divide. Okay. Thank you. Alex's opinion. If we wanted to read that, um, how would we find it so we could read it? Uh, I have a copy. I can, I can uh, this weekend, send that to Scott or, and or Donna, whoever is the leader, and you, and you guys can read through it yourself. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate it. No worries. <laughs> Eric Johnson has a question. You have to unmute yourself. Hi. Actually, uh, Alex kind of answered, Alex addressed the issue that I had, but I'm just going to repeat it because I think it's important. Um, this idea of going back to the 19, really what I would consider the 1950s anyway, maybe 60s, but the idea that somehow America was great then and it no longer is, um, is my point that it's a, it's a, an unethical, unchristian way of rationalizing something that really, to, in my view, is poisonous. Sorry, folks, if I offended anyone. Um, so before we take any more questions, Scott or Alex, were there points that you wanted to make or questions you wanted to ask uh, in terms of the movie? <laughs> yeah, I kind of got us yeah. off. I'm sorry. No, yeah, no, so, no, not at all. No, this is fascinating. I mean, fascinating. But um, if there are things that, that you wanted to talk about before we take more questions. Yeah. Yeah. So in the movie, it uh, most of it, it, it's funny that it was titled The Banker, because if you really think about it, uh, most of the movie, it was more title could have probably been uh, the real estate mogul. Right. Um, it's a. It was amazing to me to be able to see in that time, two black men, be able to amass the real estate holdings that they were able to do, when everything, even legally, uh, all the laws banks not lending to, 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 and that's my industry that I'm in, just call it what it is, not lending to black men having to get a front uh, to do that and to still have the insight and the knowledge and the, the fortitude to work and acquire, what was it, over a hundred properties, including commercial and residential, and, and really all of it was considered commercial because they had very little just a banking difference. It's single family residences, but they were buying apartment complexes, what we would call today, and and uh, and uh, office buildings, the, the tallest, 
at that time in Los Angeles. That was just astounding uh, to see that two men could figure that out and, and do that on their own when everything was uh, stacked against them. And then my part of banking for one of the protagonists to go home and see how all of the black people in his hometown were being left out of banking and what banking would mean and to put all of what he had amassed on the side and at risk to create, to purchase a bank and again, still have to not be known as the owner, which is crazy. Think about that for yourself. Some idea that you have, that your heart is really to help a lot of people, but you can't say that you own it. And that's just 50, 60 years ago. So uh, it, it was just inspiring to, for me to personally to, to do more and to try to help more people, uh, all people, <laughs> not just black people, I, to help all people reach their financial goals and whatever that means for them. So that's what I thought about it. Um, uh, I'll just uh, go one step further. Um, on a technical uh, level, I thought it was a very tight script. It was just a handful of enough characters, the way it was shot, it made you feel like you were really in it versus a lot of films, you still feel like you are an outsider looking in. So the yeah. way it was shot, the dialogue was pretty strong. I'm, I'm guessing it was extremely accurate. Um, and it pretty much had me hooked for the what, almost about two hours or so running time. And um, I just thought what was completely ironic was that um, the, the gentleman, the, um, the white gentleman they ended up using as a front, what was his name? I think it was uh, Matt or? Yeah, John the, young, um, the young kid, yep. Yes, and obviously, you know, he was, he was so committed, you know, having to like memorize all, all these math statistics. And I, that was one of my worst subjects in school, but this guy really, he, he, he applied himself. Um, and uh, the fact that it got busted up because he just didn't do his due diligence in, 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 in looking over you know, these loans. I worked, my first job out of college, I worked for, um, we, were, we were selling subprime loans. And obviously, mm. I don't think that's what they were dealing with per se, but just the fact no. that you have, to, you have to really pay attention to what you're looking at, you know, if you have an underwriter looking at next, because something, there will be an indiscretion, something will get caught by, um, uh, some uh, superior, and then it could just it could start a huge chain reaction, as it did in this case. Yeah. So, you know. But just just to add on to that, and then I'm gonna stop hogging. Uh, really, but two pieces from from a banker standpoint, you you catch it. It wasn't necessarily that he didn't do. It was that he did his didn't do his due diligence, and and not because remember the son of the bank that he bought was always behind the scene looking Florida. for something to bring them down because he figured out who the real owners were. Mm -hmm. So had he not alerted the other bank that they bought that, that package of loans from, and that, that bank that they purchased it from would have given the ones that, is it Mr. Garrett, uh, whichever the mathematician one, uh, Mr. Garrett, Mr. He, Garrett is the mathematician. That he outlined. So even without his due diligence, that's how brilliant this guy was. <laughs> that he 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 purchased a legal set of loans that would have fit that uh, that would have accomplished what they needed to at the time, and would have had the risk level low enough to where it would not have been a problem. So you had both those things: the lack of due diligence. And one of the antagonists. Um, I think Fran. Oh, okay. Um, I can't see. Yeah, Go ahead. And then, okay. um, I, I agree with you, Alex. It's almost like the um, younger white guy was like an actor. It's like somebody who's an actor playing a doctor all of a sudden thinking that they can go in and, and be part of an operation. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you're right, he was very bright in memorizing things and all, but he just didn't have the full understanding. And in three months, he thought he could, he was getting too big for his britches.
But I think yeah. the most amazing part for me was that these two men, other than fronting, having somebody else front for them, followed all the rules, had, had you know, mathematician, you know, had mathematically looked through and knew all of the, the banking rules and, the, and, and came up with this idea and were really, really successful. And unfortunately, given the time frame that it was in, they, they, they couldn't, you know, be the ones out there. But following the rules in every other sense of the, you know, the yeah. way, and then to have it, it was heartbreaking. It was really heartbreaking. Um, it was. Great movie. Yeah. Um, Mary Teresa, do you want to ask a question? Actually, more more of a comment. Uh, I was looking at the the racial implications, um, and one of the comments that was made uh, with about Mr. Garrett, "Are you angry?" And uh, I picked up on that because um, he was angry, but he, the way he took out his anger was uh, to achieve, and um, and so. And if you'll notice in one of the, when the, when, while they were still in real estate, he yeah. was subtly trying to, um, to put uh, black people in white neighborhoods in, in the Los Angeles community. And, the, it, and the, the film brought you back to that so you could see the progress that was being made in terms of the, the, what he was doing in order to equalize you know what would, what should be happening in that area um but you know the the anger didn't come out the anger came out in positive ways and the fact that they, at the end that they weren't they really weren't angry at matt who who really had screwed things up um that even when they went to when they went to prison of course matt escaped that but when they went to prison and came out they 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 still they just kept on going yeah. I thought that was amazing. It really wasn't a question; it's more of a statement. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I agree with that, and I think Molly wanted to say something. I, I agree with that, Mary. But even though it came out in, and I, I don't know this. I don't know Mr. Garrett, uh, but in, I'll tell you, in in my lifetime, even though it's nowhere near as bad, it, and and we'll get to that, but it's still some of that is really there. And what what you even though you will achieve and you try to spin it in a positive way for your person, that that anger is is bad for you, yeah. and uh, and that's what the other gentleman was trying to get him to because you have to acknowledge it, right. even though he was striving and achieving and excelling, uh, you still have to acknowledge it for your own well being. And, right. and, and and somehow handle it personally healthier because even excelling and achieving, it's still eating at you. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. It does. Um, actually, Melanie, I think, was next. You had a question, Melanie? Or comment? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, appreciate this time. Appreciate this link to uh, for me to go in and find out uh, this information. But uh, to the movie, I wrote down the question: Why did this uh, opportunity bust up? One of the t uh, I, I was just um, I echo the heartbreaking comment and uh, infuriated by the different levels of intimidation that is just so apparent as you know pulled me in as a viewer watching this story and um the ego that seems to uh be tied into the intimidation and mm -hmm. i was wondering if anyone else uh, noticed uh, two things first of all uh not not garrett but the other character um Boy, I, I, I'm, a, I'm amazed that uh, his comment was, hey, I don't ever trust a white man. And I, I, I wished I could read somewhere. It's like, why wasn't that more a mantra 
to kind of be reining in and understanding Matt. And the other part that I mm -hmm. noticed that I, I, I'm just going to throw it out there, but when Matt was yep. meeting with the two men and he was presenting this idea, here's the ego. Hey, look, now I am so good. You know, you, uh, and, and yes, I think there was like, you guys have worked with me. You are, you made me who I am, but who came down the stairs with the tray of lemonade? Who exchanged a look to her husband to say, yes, do it. It was his wife. Mm -hmm. His wife. Do you remember that folks? I that, do. Uh, and, and it was like real subtle, but she's in there too saying look you're the one that's doing all of the work you're the one but you're the reason why a little different intimidation i think but there's so much pressure so much negotiating there was way too too many hot spots that was they managed they managed so much and uh, I really appreciated their story. And I also appreciate what you bring to this discussion, Alex. So this has been fun. Thanks so far. I'll, I'll sign off now. Thanks. Um, and uh, let's see, Sally, I think you're next. You got to unmute yourself. I um, wanted to say how inspired I was by, um, you know, the, the young boy, Bernard, when he, mm. you know, 17 years old, and he obviously had some natural talent with it, but he also obviously had a lot of work put into it. He had that booklet where he had all those formulas written down, and he yeah. studied sometimes by listening in, but, he, but also probably by just working things out and um, just how inspiring that way it was. And I, I read, I didn't have time to read too much, but I went online just to see what I could find out about him. And he had an 11th grade education. So I, I didn't find anything about the other um, individual that was partnered with him, but an 11th 11th grade, you know, in Texas. And I don't know, you know, I'm not saying anything about Texas, but I would think that for a black child in Texas in, in the 1930s, you know, he might not have had all the opportunities that someone now might have. And um, so that was really inspiring that he could do that and build that from kind of the ground up with, with, um, you know, uh, not a lot of support. And the other thing that I wanted to bring up was I love the way that his, his wife was portrayed. She was strong, she was intelligent, she was willing to do what she needed to do. That was very impressive. And then I do wanna comment a little bit about the, the white wife too. It's like, I see that, and I see, I saw what you saw, but I also know that Hollywood likes to portray women sometimes as, you know, not like we are either, or maybe how we are, but how we've been trained to be too. So, you know, just, we got to keep that in mind as well. So, I guess okay. that, thank you. Thank you, Sally. Um, so Molly's been dying to talk. I do want to just to throw in one aside here, which is that I did look it up and that, that, you know, they both went to prison. It turns out they went to prison for nine months each. That's how long they went to prison for. And also uh, that Molly has pointed out that Melanie's last name is Banks. Isn't that perfect? And, and then the last thing I want to say, because Alex had said, is why, you know, why was it called the banker? It could have been the real estate agents. Uh, but the banker does refer to all three protagonists, the two black and the one white protagonist. And that, uh, and you know, that the, the white protagonist is actually a very interesting character in his own right. Um, and of course, um, set things in motion in a really bad way <laughs> for the other two. Yeah. Okay, Mo Molly, you wanna say something? Sure, I had a comment and a question. My comment is just that it's striking to me that, um, 
this movie really advances the theory of the talented 10th while also undermining that. And for people who just don't know the background, basically, I mean, I'm sure some of you know it, but just in case anyone doesn't, um, it, was in a, it was a theory created by Northern philanthropists and heavily advanced by W.E.B. Du Bois, a uh, black you know, author, academic, et cetera, from the early 1900s, that if you train pro uh, black professionals, they would pull up the rest of the race. And I had this feeling that, you know, what I was seeing in action was why the talented 10th doesn't work in a, in a society in which you have to have a white man front your, you know, front everything for you and other people can come up with ways to undermine your efforts. Um, I think I'd like kind of knew that theoretically, but it was, it, it was, you know, really powerful for me to see it in action that, that you, you can't have the talented 10th theory in, in that society. I want to kind of apply that to today. And this is where my question comes in. Um, the mortgage crisis preyed on ignorance, essentially. I mean, explicitly, several people probably know um, Miami, LA, Philadelphia, a number of other cities actually sued Wells Fargo and, and Bank of America and other banks for preying on blacks and, and won some of those suits. And that was that mortgage crisis over sub, the subprime part of it was made. But my understanding, and by the way, Alex, please correct me if I say anything wrong, okay? Um, the mortgage crisis, as far as I understand, was made possible because, they, as banks said explicitly to their employees, blacks are less savvy, African Americans are less savvy, so try to go into churches, black churches, they weren't going to white churches, by the way, try to, try to take advantage of that less savviness. So my question is this, because the same thing can happen again. You can, you can band-aid the system, you can say, let's make this part illegal, let's make this part illegal, let's make this part illegal. But my problem is that there's always another way for a bank to prey on lack of knowledge. I'm a small business owner and I'm currently in getting a line of credit from a bank and I was worried because I don't know enough. So I went, I went to one of the 300 businesses I work, I sell to stores. I went to one of the businesses I worked with and said like, tell me what I'm not seeing basically, you know, um, tell me how, what to look for. And I think a lot of people just maybe don't know other successful small businesses to ask that. So I'm kind of wondering, this is a huge question, but I know that you're CEO and you want to do a lot of education. How does financial literacy at scale nationally prevent another 2008 recession? Mm. How can financial literacy at scale prevent another recession? Great question, Molly. So I'm going to come back to that. Just let me go to your talented tent. So mm -hmm. first, and then I'll, then I'll come to that. Um, I'm on the other side of the coin with you on, on, on that talented tent. I think it can work if things are fair and equitable. And laws are in place today that are more fair and equitable than as compared to that time. In actual practice, and I was going to say this toward the end, it's not much different uh, because banking and lending to anyone, any business unit I talked about, is an art and a science. It's not just the numbers. There's a person behind it. And if that person has implicit biases, it skews it. So there has to be a change, and this will lead to your question, it has to be a change in, you have to have diversity and inclusion and equity all throughout a financial institution. And it has to be a part of the core of your culture. When it's not, people will not be the name of your group. They won't be better angels. They will defer to what's known and what's been taught to all of us in this country, unless you're a, a new immigrant, is that at its basis, agree, push back or not, the thought has been and still promulgates today that people of color are lesser. So if that's there, and I'm analyzing a similarly situated mortgage, just use mortgage, somebody with a 650 credit score, that's right at the cutoff, uh, debt to income of 38%, that's right at the cutoff, um, both been on the job, 
same amount of time, say five years. Uh, both have limited liquidity. Uh, so all the things are just over. One's African American, one's white. So many, so many studies have been proven that the white person will get the approval and the black person will get either denied or pushed into some of the products that you're talking about. So financial literacy alone won't work. What will help is, and, and I, I, personally, I don't like literacy because it innately says somebody is illiterate. It's more financial education and then empowering people to come in at whatever level they are and then move to the level that they want to achieve. Mm -hmm. So it's financial education and empowerment that has to happen, but it's a whole lot of healing that a lot of banks don't want to do because that's a difficult conversation if you're African-American and for history, all the way back, you've been either denied or put in predatory products for the most part, and that's happened to the most part of everybody in your circle. Mm -hmm. And that's still in 2020, the lived experience. Now, again, I put the big disclaimer, most of my career has been at a community bank in the St. Louis region. So that's 23 of 28 years, five years, I, I did travel and manage groups across the country, but five versus 23 is, is different. So mm -hmm. does that, that answer your question? That was a brilliant answer um, because you went a lot deeper than I was expecting. Thank you. I, th I thought you would talk about literacy nationally. And sorry, what was the word you used? Empowerment? Education uh, and empowerment. Education and empowerment. I thought you were talking about like maybe a national program, but I think you make a good point that I hadn't thought of, which is like, it also matters who on the other side of the table is approving or not approving your loan. And I thought of that when I was at a bank recently because I had just seen the banker when I went to get my own loan. I asked for eleven or $12,000 loan and they offered me a $50,000 line of credit. And I was like, wow, like how would this experience have been different if I didn't come in like I did? Uh, right. And being white, you know, and um, it, it definitely affected me a lot. So thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, I believe you uh, have a question. And then I want to go to Stanley. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, what affected me in the film was how little I know about the, this race problem. And uh, I've been very fortunate in my life in that, um, you know, I, I've grown up mostly in white neighborhoods and my parents were not um, prejudiced. I, I didn't have uh, anything going on. I didn't have black friends when I was in school. Um, I didn't have anything against black people. Uh, when I be, when I went into business, um, it, it just happens that over the years, some of my best friends have been black people, and and it did. I didn't make friends with them because they were black or whatever. I was in a group with them. We hit it off. We were you know good friends. Um, I've been volunteering at Folsom Prison for about five years and uh, once a week in a meditation group. And, um, you know, the, all the minorities are there. Um, and um, there's probably, um, and the group is about 25 people. Um, there's maybe three or four white guys and the rest are black or Hispanic or Asian, which I don't know how to, how to make what to make of that. My point is that uh, we have never, uh, you know, what we do is we go in, we do a little yoga or Tai Chi. We do 30 minutes of meditation. One of us gives a Dharma talk. It's Buddhist oriented. And um, then we have feedback and just doing that. And then before and after, uh, the meeting, it lasts for two and a half hours. We have time to just circulate and talk to people and hang out. And I can honestly say that um, these guys are some of the best friends I've ever had. 
And I, I, I've never, no one has ever raised the issue of race or, or anything. You know, it's like, so I, my life and I saw two, two aspects of the movie. One was um, that I don't know much about real race issues from a black person's viewpoint um, out, in, out in the real world, you know, and I'd like to know more. Um, the other is from a business point of view, um, there are predators, banking predators that pr will prey on white, black, Mexican, Asian, you name it. Um, so uh, I understand that there, there was prejudice because of the redlining and uh, the laws and stuff like that. But I can tell you from personal experience that, um, and just like Molly was saying, <clears throat> I didn't trust any bankers, you know. I, I had to, uh, you know, I had to, uh, you know, I had an attorney friend who was my black friend, um, uh, you know, review stuff with me and so on and so forth. So, but um, my question, Alex, is um, I think there's absolutely no question at all that many do this just like, wow, this is a surprise, you know? And we, we would truly want to do something about this. Be, and I, what I've, my, my main point is relationship and a spiritual um, background has really um, taken the different, you know, different races. And I'm not sure if I said that right. Um, in other words, you know, because of a spiritual interest and because of just, just hanging out, you're just friends, you know, and it doesn't matter what, what race you are. And um, I'm wondering uh, from you, white people and black, black or other men, minorities, uh, I think really change anybody's heart. But how can we put our hearts together with black people so that we become humans to each other and have a really strong, loving relationship? That's for, that's for that's me, my, Richard. Yes, uh, yes, Alex, that's, that's my question. Sure. So... So let me put this out there. Uh, you said yours was more of a Buddhist slant and, and you know, uh, believe the faith. Everybody be open to whatever faith for them. For me, I'm, I'm Christian. So uh, that's in, that's, that heart thing is that's an individual choice. No, nobody else. The only way I can impact any of you all or anybody that I come across with is, is, how I choose to believe and then what I give out. What I give out can't change you. Um, and it's not anybody's job to change someone else. It's, it's my job, regardless of how I'm treated, to love and respect and honor within boundaries, within boundaries. You know, I'm not gonna let anybody, I'm married, four daughters, adult daughters, three granddaughters, uh, so I'm not going to let anybody hurt the women that I love. So that's a different animal. But outside of physical harm, so I, I think it's in our action. And then a big part of, I got to commend you guys, a big part of what you're doing. Open discussion, agree, disagree, listen, and then, and, and then be honest with yourself. Because um, one of the early parts of what you said is, you know, it's a whole lot of people that, again, in my lived experience, that just will not even say, I had no idea, this, that, or the other. And, and now seeing a film like The Banker has opened my eyes and then being a part of Better Angels in this conversation has made me kind of challenge that. So I would put that back, that's, that's a Richard deal that uh, that you have to work through, just like it's an Alex deal, or a Donna deal, or or Scott. 
Awesome. I just want to interject for one second. We have about 10 minutes left and there's about four folks with yeah, questions. Yeah. I don't know if we get to yeah, everyone, okay. but I want to do, I yeah, want to do Stanley wait. next. Okay. okay. Great. Okay, I will uh, try to uh, be fairly brief. Um, I have some very close friends who've been in the banking industry for 50 plus years. Um, large banks, large investment companies, uh, made it up fairly high. Um, and it was rife with prejudice, as was a lot of other places. Um, um, race, uh, religion, um, uh, ethnicity, um, um, et cetera. Uh, <clears throat> um, so it didn't surprise me uh, in the movie, the theme of the movie, uh, because I've been told about this quite quite often, and I've seen some of it from the outside, etc. Uh, I remember when we uh, had a community that was basically all white, uh, and one of the people leaving wanted to um, sell their home to an African American, um, and uh, the neighborhood, a lot of the neighbors got together and bought the house, and then sold it to white person from the housing side. Um, so I saw that happen. Uh, luckily for me, my father decided not to participate, even though he was born in Lynchburg, Virginia, uh, and was a Southern gentleman, he decided not to participate. What got me in the movie, what was interesting, was all the people in power in the industry were all male. So, I didn't talk about sex being uh, uh, an issue, but that was too. Now, also not just in the banking industry in those times, we're talking about in the 40s and the 50s. I mean, it was rife throughout. Um, my personal feeling is we've gotten much better. Uh, we're heading in the right direction. Most people, uh, we're not there. I don't know if we're halfway there or a third, but we're definitely not there. Uh, and you're right. Uh, it's a cultural thing. Um, uh, rules and laws help, I think, uh, but they're only like guidance. Uh, you're right. You have to change your heart. You can, if you have the signs in front of you, you still have to read them. Um, and I don't know if you've seen any of that either, Alex. But at least that's what I got out of the out of the movie. Yeah. One, of the, one of the points. Absolutely, and and uh, thank you. Uh, well, thank you all. I, I have said thank you with everybody's comment. Uh, so that's, I don't think your, your, your percentage is, is, is probably a little uh, hopeful. Uh, it's absolutely better, but it's probably we're maybe 10% of the way. And uh, you just, just you, you put it in, in, in the, I actually 10% is probably not even, if you go CEO, we're less than 1%. Women. Women led CEOs of financial institutions in 2020 is less than 1%. It's 5,000 banks and credit unions in the country. And it's, it's not 50 uh, women CEO and chairman. So that's less than 1%. So we got a long, 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 long way to go. Uh, for us, uh, you know, just a shameless plug, somebody said, so I'm not the CEO of Midwest Bank Center. I'm an exact. I'm blessed where I'm at. I'm an executive vice president, but my my boss is African American, a male, and our leadership team at our bank ten ten EVPs or higher. Uh, it's three African American men. I'm, I'm one of, uh, and four Caucasian women. So seventy percent of our leadership is uh, is diverse. And we have not found another bank like us in the country. And now we're small. We're only 2 billion in assets, 18 locations, only in the St. Louis market at this time. We're looking to grow and go to other markets, but that's where we are. So, so Stanley, you're spot on. I did catch that, that didn't go past me. Not, uh, not a woman in, in leadership anywhere on the real estate side or on the bank side at that time. 
and it needs to be because the, the irony in it, and then I'll, I'll be quiet because I know time is running out, but the irony in it is that banking is like 70% in general, about 70% women. All, all employees, 70%. Any bank, credit union, I, do an eye test on it. Next time you're in, if you look, it's about 70% where we're in a global pandemic. So don't do it now, do it later. Uh, but 70% female, but then we don't have that many women at the top. Makes no sense. Uh, next, Blake, I believe you had a question. Yes, thank you. Um, I was inspired by the movie. It was fantastic. Uh, my questions revolve around two things. I bank with Navy Federal Credit Union because my old Navy buddies also belong there. And my Navy buddies are from a diverse group. Many white, many black, many Hispanic, doesn't matter. So I'm curious how many banks, and I, I do apologize, I had to take a call while this was on. How many banks across the United States have black ownership? And when are you gonna to come to Denver? I'll open an account with you. <laughs> Thank you, Blake. Um, um, just uh, honestly, between us uh, here, that Denver is actually one of the markets that we are looking at. And we were aggressively, aggressively looking at Denver pre-COVID-19. So um, that's, that stopped a lot. But there are only 21 of 5,000 uh, uh, majority owned black banks in the country. That number used to be over 200 and it has steadily dwindled over the years and none are larger than one, I think the largest is less than 2 billion in assets. So that's not even a lot of scale. Um, so un unfortunately, I, I do know the answer to that. Um, and it's, it's a sad one. Um, Melanie, you had a question? Thank you. Um, what I'd like to find out is, um is this uh, do you still do you still see this strong presence i mean our discussion is unfortunately revealing that there is still a very strong presence of uh, inequality going on with lending um i mean this has been very helpful i i think um the, the, the big question I have is how, uh, how do I help stop the, uh, the issue? Um, I mean, do we connect with whoever is involved with the house, uh, fair housing issue that was posted in the, uh, written in the Washington Post? I mean, it's got to go, we, Grassroots has got to just not be listening, I, even though I'm, I'm here to listen, but I'm wanting to take some of my energy that I am gaining from being part of the Braver Angels to not just be on a Zoom, but it's, I, want to, I want to take away, Alex. What do I do when I go up and think, uh, okay, what, how, how can I address this? And could I honestly just start asking my bank um, about their diversity within their, um, you know, just a simple question, but to let people know that I'm wanting to know who, who's on this board and is there diversity because it's important to me to see, you know, so I'm starting there by just asking a diversity question. So thank you for the time that I had with you. No, you're uh, you're you're very welcome. And so there, there's a lot <laughs> that that you can do, especially someone who has made uh, um, the the statements that you just made. So just just a few off the top of my head that that I could think. You said one, research where you hold your money. You you're a, a paying customer. They're they're making money on your deposits. Uh, you may have a loan. Find out. 
If diversity and inclusion is important to you, you should know that. It's probably in, in their CRA. You may not even have to ask, uh, and which I didn't talk about. And, and if we have time, Scott, I'll, I'll end on my thoughts on with the Community Reinvestment Act. But their public file, all banks' public file, has to be posted on their website, not credit unions. Credit unions are not a part of, and I'm not against credit unions, don't hear that, but they're not subject to the Community Reinvestment Act. Just banks are. Uh, every FDIC insured institution is. So, so one, that, that's, you named a great one. Find out and then make, make a decision. That, so the second part of that is, if you don't like where they are, then find a bank in your area that is progressive or at least striving to be diverse and inclusive. Um, uh, I would argue to say find a Midwest Bank Center because I didn't even talk about our legal board. Our legal board is over 50% diverse. So 19 board members, 11 are uh, either women or, or um, minorities via ethnic, ethnicity. Again, we don't know of another example of that level of diversity. It's one of our core values. Um, and we've been that for probably the last, started on this path about the last 11 years when, uh, uh, this sounds, but when I joined the bank to push us in this direction. Um, so, so that's the second thing. You can, you can find a bank and then make a decision to move your money, your loans, somewhere that agrees with your, uh, with, uh, uh, with your beliefs. Third, when I, when I will do this on, on my to-do, but give me till tomorrow, I got, I got my grandbaby coming over and I haven't got to see her in a while. So I'm about to head off of here and go do that. So it'll be tomorrow before I send you the, uh, the, the new law uh, that was signed or, or at least the bill. So then write your congr congressman about it. If you don't believe it's fair, flood them, that still works, flood them and say, this makes no sense. This is not the America I wanna be a part of. Uh, and then the last thing I would say, um, uh, because again, again, this feels like a sh shameless plug, but uh, there is a ton of things a bank can do remotely or in, so look up Midwest Bank Center. If you're, I'm gonna ask Scott to put my information out. If you've liked some of what I said and you believe in what we're trying to accomplish and the model bank we're trying to be, yeah, we're in St. Louis, but there's a ton of things we can do online. It's amazing the things that you can do without having a physical brick and mortar location. I'll pause there. Well, Alex, I really appreciate it. We've come up on one hour. This has been a phenomenal discussion. Thank you very much for um, spending this time with us. And it's great to meet all you guys and thanks for all your questions. It was awesome.